About a year ago, Dave Morrison of How to Power Magazine conducted a survey of smart power supply engineers about their interest in power integrity versus power electronics. The responses revealed a recurring misconception about power integrity. Almost immediately, I wrote a response in the form of an article titled, This One Misconception About Power Integrity Is Going to Cost You Big Bucks. Space systems as an industry has lagged behind other industries, including automotive, portable electronics, computers, and others, in acquiring the awareness and skills necessary to ensure power integrity. The lagging interest combined with an insufficient selection of components and divergent corporate goals all contributed to today's unfortunate state of power integrity. So what was that one misconception? It's that power integrity is a system issue handled by system engineers. I'm now so consumed by power integrity issues that I don't have time for much else. Today I'm going to share the fundamentals of power integrity and just a few of the dozens of issues that we've seen over the past year. The Power Distribution Network, or PDN, connects the VRM, aka power supply, at one end of the system, through the printed circuit board planes, including the decoupling capacitors, to the circuits we actually do care about, aka the loads. Within this, PDN noise flows through the system in many and seemingly mysterious ways. Noise is conducted from the VRM through the planes appearing at the loads, while noise from the loads is transmitted through the printed circuit board appearing at other loads as well as back at the VRM. Noise is also coupled from the currents and voltages through the air, where it can be received by sensitive circuits through printed circuit board planes and traces appearing as antennae. So why should you be concerned about power integrity? Very simply, because as my first boss taught me, it's never about the power supply. Our job in power electronics is to allow others to do their job well. The loads are the microwave circuits, LNAs, and data channels that do the real work in our systems. Power integrity is the effort that goes into making sure all of those loads stay within their allowable voltage limits, and that they achieve their necessarily optimum performance. Modern devices have lower operating voltages with even smaller allowable voltage limits. This is in addition to the fact that edges are fast and switching currents are higher than ever. And we're just beginning to enter the world of gallium nitride, which will increase power supply edge speeds to sub-nanosecond levels. When I founded AEI in 1995, every report we issued included a note stating that printed circuit board characteristics were not accounted for in this analysis. Today I would have to say don't bother. There are a few circuits, including power, that aren't severely impacted by the printed circuit board, whether it's for the better or for the worse. Each power rail, like its RF counterparts, needs to be properly balanced. It can be viewed as a child's teeter-totter. The impedance is nice and level when the VRM, printed circuit board, and loads are all properly matched. And when they aren't matched, the result is always increased impedance. The addition of the printed circuit board and the decoupling capacitors are not independent of, but are rather an extension of this principle. This is how and why the power supply is fundamental to the performance of the high-speed load. It's also the reason that decoupling must be carefully designed to match the board and not selected by some arbitrary rules of thumb. This real-world example illustrates this clearly. Here we can see the impedance of a power supply measured at its load, which in this case is a low jitter clock. Three cases show that as the ESR of the capacitor is reduced, the impedance peak at the clock is increased. Counterintuitively, significantly raising the power supply impedance reduces the impedance at the clock, completely eliminating the resonance. And this resonance is the cause of a jitter-inducing clock spur seen here in the clock spectrum plot. But why does it need to be flat? Isn't lower better? In a single word, no. 
We just showed this using our clock example, but here's another approach. There are three basic decoupling design strategies. One is called the big V. It looks like the letter V, and it's the result of multiple parallel low ESR capacitors. There's multipole, which is what most engineers try to achieve blindly, applying rules of thumb. And then there's flat impedance control. These three impedance profiles and the resulting transients are the work of Isvan Novak, a brilliant power integrity pioneer and the power integrity guru at Oracle. The flat impedance results in a transient that's 40% lower than the second closest multipole and even more than 50% lower than the big V. So flat impedance in a word is efficient. A secondary issue is that even small capacitor tolerances applied to the multipole decoupling scheme cause disproportionate trouble. Consider the typical power rail requirements of an FPGA. Typical power rail limits are 5% or less, inclusive of all effects. This includes the DC regulation, the switching ripple, dynamic response to load-induced transients, conducted susceptibility, and these are the end-of-life limits. As a result, only about 1.5% of the power rail vo voltage can be budgeted for dynamic transients. For a 1 volt power rail, that's 15 millivolts. In the case of phase lock loops, clocks, and LNAs, the budgets are typically much tighter, where even microvolts of noise can degrade performance. And many engineers find dynamic current confusing. Yes, the FPGA current is different in standby than it is in operating. And yes, this is dynamic. But there are really two kinds of dynamic currents. Each high-speed pin, or I.O., has a capacitance associated with it. And that means that there's a current due to charging this pin capacitance. This capacitive current is independent of the excitation frequency. In this scope image, a single CMOS logic gate generates a nearly 1 volt transient on the power rail due to charging its 5 picofarad pin capacitance in a 300 picosecond edge speed. Typical memory devices can do this with dozens of pins simultaneously, and FPGAs can do this with hundreds of pins simultaneously, and many devices can do this faster than 300 picoseconds. These can generate current spikes that are in tens of amps and even higher. As these pins are switched, there's also an averaging effect, which is frequency dependent. The higher the frequency, the higher the integrated average current, but the current spike is always the same. There are numerous challenges we face in power integrity, and many of them are listed here. In the best of cases, the semiconductor companies believe their data to be highly confidential. Recently, that's also come to include the power supply compensation networks that they don't want to share. It's difficult, if at all possible, to design a stable power supply, much less achieve flat output impedance without knowledge of the internal compensation network. And much of the data we receive from the manufacturers is poor fidelity for PI applications, it's misleading, and in some cases it's erroneous. Complicating things further, the load circuit designer, printed circuit board designer, and power supply designer don't even share a common jargon. This is truly an unfortunate state, and the one that costs us all in performance, program delays, and cost overruns. At AEI, we're finding and dealing with significant power integrity issues on every single project. The case isn't lost, at least not yet. We can and we must improve the current state of power integrity. Most importantly, power supply engineers need to learn the basics of power integrity and the susceptibilities of the load circuits they're powering. Decoupling design is not arbitrary and there are causes and effects of the architectural level that need to be understood and carefully weighed. For example, Placing a VRM on one side of the circuit board and the load circuit on the other has significant ramifications. Using a central power supply that's off card extracts a price in decoupling, and the use of ferrite beads requires the perfect selection of decoupling capacitors, 
to flatten its response. These are not independent choices, but negotiated trade-offs. Understanding the essential need for flat impedance is completely lost on this power supply measurement performed just a few months ago. There are two very pronounced impedance peaks in addition to two big V's evident in this impedance and this is just within the first 30 megahertz. This horrific impedance could be corrected with the proper decoupling capacitors, though in this case it's unlikely the solution would fit on the board. This is an unfortunate but common outcome that often requires a complete redesign to correct. The proper selection of VRM followed by the correct PC board design and decoupling don't happen by accident, but by careful planning, simulation, and preparatory measurements and characterizations. This is another example of a recent power supply measurement. This space qualified DC to DC converter is unstable as clearly seen in the transient response and also in the output impedance plot. This instability causes not only an increase in noise, but also EMI in addition to the complex uphill battle of attempting to justify an oscillating circuit as being acceptable for flight. This recent example shows what happens when oscillator designers attempt to design power supplies. Oscillator designers are very good at making things oscillate. This oscillating power supply is contained inside a low jitter reference clock hybrid. The power supply generates EMI, easily observed from outside the clock. Despite an abundance of extra filtering between the power supply and the oscillator, the power supply instability still shows up clearly as a spur in the phase noise and also in the spectral purity plots. Last, I wanted to share a simulation from an article I co-authored with Ken Wyatt for the 2017 EMC Directory and Design Guide. This simulation illustrates how the use of a single ceramic capacitor can add 20 dB of conducted EMI noise. This 20 dB EMI increase is due to just a single ceramic capacitor placed on the opposite side of the printed circuit board from the VRM, which is a common practice. And it's certainly possible to cross from one side of the circuit board to the other, but only if the PDN is properly balanced. There are a couple of things I hope you'll take away from this presentation today. Power integrity matters to every element in the system, and that means it matters to you. Don't ignore it, and don't think you can fix it later, because you can't. It isn't likely, if it's at all possible, to get it right the first time. Renowned SI expert Eric Bogadin says work hard to try to get it right the second time. Perform measurements on low-cost characterization boards before selecting the VRM and before designing it into an expensive, long-lead, multi-layer circuit board. Design for flat impedance right from the very beginning. This requires planning, strategy, and skill. Plan for both simulation and testing throughout the design cycle at the component level and also at the circuit level. If you aren't skilled in power integrity, attend a basic workshop, or start reading to gain the basics. In the meantime, find an expert before you get into trouble. Here are some links to additional resources related to power integrity. And thanks for attending today's session.